Chloe Zhao's Nomadland won the Best Picture Oscar for 2020. When I finally got a chance to see it, I was floored by how much it resonated with me. It's a portrait of a woman uprooted after her home, a mining company town in Nevada, dissolves after the company goes under. Forced to live out of her van, she encounters an entire subculture of people who, willingly or not, live nomadically in their vehicles. They refer to themselves as houseless, but not homeless. The film features real-life people, lending it a semi-documentary air. And honestly, while Nomadland doesn't have much plot, that doesn't mean nothing happens. It's built of little moments, marrying the cosmic and the common. One scene, our main character watches the stars wheel overhead. Five minutes later, she's scrubbing a shit stain out of a gas station toilet to make a few bucks. It celebrates life for all its beautiful and unpleasant moments. And it strings together these moments in a way that's unorthodox, but still tells a complete story about a woman who, in grave misfortune, comes to reassess what she values and what her place is in the world. It's cinematic poetry, and it made me a huge fan of Chloe Zhao, proving her as a unique and powerful filmmaking voice. Anyways, let's talk about Eternals. In case you're watching this years and years later, this movie caused quite a stir when it came out. It was the first film in the Marvel Cinematic Universe to be labeled Rotten on Rotten Tomatoes. Twitter was a firestorm about whether Rotten Tomatoes and critics are important, and whether people were being unfair to it because it featured women, and non-white actors, and a gay kiss, and sign language. And to be sure, if that's your problem with the movie, and you're looking for the guy with the furry avatar to rant about how quote-unquote woke the movie is, you're not gonna find that here. Honestly, the whole uproar about this movie is so confusing to me. Because on the one hand, no, I don't think it's particularly great, and it baffles me that people talk about it as some grand revolutionary triumph. But at the same time, this is the Marvel movie that critics turned on? This is the one that got the first MCU rotten score? Because here's the thing, the film's not even really that bad. It's definitely one of the better looking Marvel movies. Hell, I think you can make a case that it's the best looking Marvel movie. The fight scenes are shot smoothly and are easy to watch. The general concept is interesting. A small group of immortal super beings need to protect Earth but are forbidden from interfering in human affairs. Who gives up on the humans? Who breaks their oath and intervenes anyways? Who stays true to the mission? Then there's a twist where they find out their mission isn't what they thought it was. Instead, they are basically raising humans to a certain population level to harness the energy needed for a new celestial to be born from the planet in The Emergence. It'll mean billions of lives snuffed out, but the celestial will then go on and create trillions more lives in the long run. Is that an acceptable trade-off? It's an interesting question that I think Chloe Zhao was the right woman to tap for. I also really like a good chunk of these characters. Druig is interesting, watching him grow frustrated about being blocked from protecting humans from themselves, and he eventually breaks his oath of non-interference. Fastos has... something resembling a character arc at least, as he's at first eager to share technology with humans, but over time grows horrified by what they do with it. Sprite has an interesting conflict, a centuries-old person eternally stuck within a child's body, and they... kinda almost do something with that? Yeah, okay, so this is where problems begin to arise, and it's difficult to talk about them because they're all interconnected. It's hard to focus and explain one issue without getting sidetracked into another, but I'm gonna do my best to try and tease it all out. So, first of all, like I said, there are good characters in this movie. Unfortunately, they're shoved to the side because our main character is Cersei. And I say unfortunately because honestly, she's the most boring character among them. Her shtick is that she was in love with Icarus, who's basically an off-brand Superman, before they broke up and now she's dating Kit Harrington, who has like two scenes and only exists to set up the Black Knight or whatever. Then Cersei is chosen to lead the group after their previous leader, Ajax, is killed. And then she petrifies the giant god at the end, stopping the emergence. She doesn't really come to any kind of new place by the end of the movie, either through a shift of motivation or opinion or so on. Fastos does, Druig does, Cersei does not. Sure, she finds out the truth of her mission, but it's spoken at her, not uncovered by any effort of her own. 
Her greatest utility to the story is to have things exposited to her, and being an object of affection for Icarus, the other most boring character in the movie. Icarus is one of the only Eternals who knows about their true mission, besides the leader. And when the leader decides to try and backtrack at the last moment to stop the emergence, Icarus kills her and frames it on the Deviants. He's blinded by his loyalty to the Celestials, and... I don't know, that's kind of it, really. A big problem in this movie is that the acting is all over the place. There's this infamous scene... Got shot. Admittedly is a bit of an extreme example, but a lot of this movie is acted without emotion. I don't know if I'd call them super obviously bad, but combined with the very sparse relationship writing, I don't feel invested in Icarus's relationship with Cersei, or their relationship with any of the other Eternals. I feel like more screen time could have been devoted to the more interesting characters, or at least to elaborating more on Cersei and Icarus, and less on the CGI monster deviants. Speaking of, the CGI monster deviants are bad bad guys. And I don't mean bad as in an imposing threat, I mean they're really uninteresting showing up to wreak mindless havoc until our heroes can punch them into oblivion. They randomly appear whenever Kevin Feige pops in and says, Hey Chloe, it's been 15 minutes since our last action scene. Send in the Deviants. There's this potentially interesting concept with the Deviants where one of them attacks and harvests the soul essence from a couple of the Eternals, growing more humanoid. And he talks about how Deviants were originally created by Celestials to do their bidding before going rogue and how the Eternals are killing them, and each time an emergence happens, Deviants are slaughtered, which makes them angry for obvious reasons. This has a potentially very intriguing emotional conflict. And then Angelina Jolie just cuts off his head and he's done. I've heard some suggestions saying Eternals should have been a Disney Plus series in order to elaborate on the other side characters. Eternals doesn't need a Disney Plus series, it needs to cut out the Deviants altogether and use its time more wisely. The movie grinds to a halt whenever these fight scenes happen. But I know, they gotta keep the fights in there because that's what Marvel thinks needs to happen. And those fights are more important than the drama. And that's what irks me about the movie. It's almost a drama. It feels like it's trying to be a drama, but it's chained down. Like, let's dig into the story a bit. The Eternals are sent to Earth to protect humans from the Deviants. They only intervene in human affairs when Deviants are involved. Along the way, they try to do little things to help boost civilization along. And they have disagreements among themselves about how strictly to follow their orders. And these are the parts where the movie does feel interesting. As humans advance, their capability for terribleness grows, and it makes the disagreements among the Eternals more pronounced. At the Siege of Tenochtitlan, Druig the Mind Controller finally snaps and forces the Spaniards and Nawa peoples alike to seize their fighting, and he retreats into the forest with them to build a quiet paradise. Fastos is eager, even over-eager, to share the wonders of technology with humans, wanting to give the Babylonians a steam engine in 3000 BC. Cut to him later, in the ruins of Hiroshima after the atom bomb has been detonated, and he regrets ever giving them anything. But again, these characters are not the main characters of the movie, and they seem to very suddenly turn on a dime. Druig's conflict resolves when they're attacked, and Cersei tells him to let go of the humans' minds to let them run to the river. But couldn't he have just told them telepathically to go to the river? There's nothing here to actually change his motivation. And a couple scenes later, he explains why he didn't just take over the minds of every human in the world. Violence, fear, greed, all gone. Why didn't you? Because without their flaws, they wouldn't be human. You didn't think this was a problem for 500 years, Druig? What the hell? It just doesn't make any sense. Fastos at least makes a little more sense, because despite him being resentful at humans abusing the technology he gave them, he realizes that his husband and son will be killed in the emergence, and decides to help stop it. And the thing is, Fastos is basically an encapsulation of what I wanted for this movie. He knows on a macro scale, humans have done horrible things, and he's been around to see a lot of those horrible things. But in the immediate, he still loves them. It's an actual conflict that I would have loved to see expanded on, and also to have seen present in other characters. 
Kingo is a big movie star. He has been for a century, presenting himself as his own son over and over again. And yet he has no problem with Earth dying and losing that. Not even a little regret about what he'd lose? A little conflict in there? I still have faith in Arisham, but I refuse to hurt any of you from my beliefs. The movie does a lot to present the terrible side of humanity, but it doesn't show the great things humans have done to try to make this a more even-sided conflict. The one saving grace they mention is that... Five years ago, Thanos erased half of the population of the universe. But the people of this planet brought everyone back with a snap of a finger. Humans defeated Thanos. We don't get to see how humans can seemingly make friends with any species, or how we can create awe-inspiring art, or anything about humanitarian leaders trying to fight for a better world. The movie's debate about the value of human life ends up ringing hollow because of that. Nomadland showed the wide spectrum of human existence. Eternals does not. The movie tricks you into thinking it's deep by presenting the question, are humans worth saving? And then it doesn't really answer it in any meaningful way. We get the surface level answer of, yes, humans are worth saving, just because its proponents are the only people standing at the end. You wanna know who did this better? You really wanna know? The My Teacher is an Alien book series. Now I'm dead serious. The final book in the series is My Teacher Flung to the Planet, where this alien civilization has basically placed humanity on trial, and a guilty verdict means that Earth will be destroyed. So these kids have to find a reason for humanity to be spared. And they see all these terrible things like war and whatnot, and it's held up as proof that humans are bad and should be destroyed. But then, the kids counter with something that, surprisingly, has stayed with me into adulthood. In every bad situation, even when humans are causing terrible things, there are also humans trying to help. Every natural disaster has people trying to save each other. Every outbreak of violence is accompanied by people trying to mollify the effects. And that proves to be enough potential for good that the Earth is spared. Maybe that resonates with you like it did me. Maybe you think it's too optimistic and naive, but at least the story offered an answer. That's the kind of statement Eternals needed. Because you want to know how this movie ends? After the talking and the pondering and whatnot? It ends in a big CGI fight and a CGI landscape as invincible people with powers throw each other around. Cersei tries to petrify the emerging Celestial, and Icarus breaks away from the others to stop her, and then looks at her and realizes he still loves her. And that's enough for him to totally switch sides and join the Yuna mind so she can be powerful enough to use her powers to kill the giant alien god. Icarus is never defeated on a rhetorical level. Sprite joins him, and she has this moment where she just wants to start over, to forget being trapped in her body. A compelling reaction to her situation, and then just gets knocked out by a rock until the fight finishes, complete with a neat little quip from Druig. The movie never answers its own question, such as, are humans worth saving? The best answer it gives us is, yes, humans are worth saving because humans defeated Thanos. Which is not an answer that holds any weight outside of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Everyone told me, Daniel, you have to see Eternals, it's different from every other MCU movie. After seeing it, that's like saying wavy potato chips are different from plain potato chips. This is exactly the same as every other Marvel movie. The story is resolved in the same damn way, it has the same reliance on action scenes, it has to make references to the existing lore despite it actively undercutting the logic of its own story. The movie feels like it'll flip a switch and drop any sense of gravity it has to put on the same wisecracking comedy shtick. Hi. Hello. Hey, who's your gardener? Kingo's comic relief role wore thin on me real frickin' fast. I like Karun, though. The camera guy? Karun is cool. He's innocent in all this. Karun is best Avenger. Taken as a whole, though, The Eternals is not an elevation of the MCU. It's a debasement of a filmmaker who holds so much promise. The movie touts itself as diverse both in front of the camera and behind, but that means nothing if the actual story being told is still engineered by the same handful of top guys. 
Don't get me wrong, I actually kinda like the MCU. At least up through Endgame and even Far From Home, I was invested in what was going on, where things were going. It was a lot of fun, I really enjoyed it. Seeing Infinity War opening night is one of my favorite theater-going experiences ever. But it's starting to all come undone. It used to enhance each individual film to have them connect to each other, but now it feels like a manacle weighing them down. As long as Marvel movies have to end in a sterile punch fest that is meant to be as inoffensive as possible, to as many people as possible, they can never make anything truly beautiful. All the neat little visual tricks in the world, all the comic book references, all the lip service to social issues, and all the faux philosophy window dressing you can cram into two hours of screen time mean little when the stories you tell never, ever change. At least I can look forward to Zhao's next project, which will surely be another small production where she's allowed creative control to- Oh, come on!